and welcome to Hurt Less, Live More, a show where we acknowledge all the hurts we've experienced in life and find ways to move on from them to live life to the full. I'm JJ Stenhouse, the practical alchemist, and I'm here as ever with psychiatrist and coach Dr. Mark Goulston. And today, you've just got the two of us. We're going to have a chat between ourselves and hopefully we'll come up with some interesting stuff that might pique your interest. What do you reckon, Mark? I think that's a great idea. I'm looking forward to today. <laughs> excellent, excellent. So, what are we going to talk about? That's the that's the big question. Well, uh, before we started recording, I was talking to you about that. I come from an abundant mindset, and uh, and I I didn't always come from that, and I I actually live to give. I probably mentor forty five people. Um, I believe some of them pay coaches for what they're getting for free from me, but that's okay. Probably, probably. As one of them said, <laughs> she said, you know, Mark, the difference between a coach and a mentor is mentors are free. <laughs> yeah, it's probably true. <laughs> but but uh, I don't mind that, but I, I wanted to share a story. So how is it that I came to become, uh, a, come from an abundant mindset now, some people listening in will say, that's not abundant. That's a, you're being a fool, Mark. <laughs> but I don't think so. And I think part of it, and I've probably talked about this in prior uh, episodes, um, I dropped out of medical school twice, probably for untreated depression. And I think up until that time, I did not come from an abundant mindset. In fact, one of the ways that I would cover up anxiety and fear, which I had a fair amount of, was I was very sarcastic. I was very cynical. Uh, I got away with it because people told me, oh, you were so funny You could with, with your humor. But I realized it was all a cover-up. And then what happened is I'm going through medical school, and something I've discovered recently, which may explain why medical school is difficult, uh, I, I've discovered that I have dyslexia. So even though I've written nine books, 1,100 articles. I can write, I can speak, but I read very slowly. Mm. And I comp- I comprehend most things, but my ability to recall, my retention is really hard unless it's really something that I'm focused on. In fact, one of the things that I'm dreading is I'm getting close to having to renew my driver's license. And when I look at the booklet, for the Department of Motor Vehicles, I said, this could be the time when I switch to Uber because I'm not going to remember, you know, how many feet you are, how many meters behind the person in front of you? What do you do on a left turn or a right turn? So, uh, but anyway, I've got, uh, I've still got another year for that. But what happened is uh, I, I think, you know, I reached this low point in medical school and the second time I wanted to leave they wanted to kick me out because they were losing matching funds. And I met with the head of the school and I don't remember the meeting, but I think he thought we're going to kick this kid out and I don't want him to do anything self-destructive. So I got a call from the Dean of students who cares about students. And he said, you need to come in here. I got to have a letter here from the main Dean. And I went in there and the main letter said, uh, or the main dean had said, uh, met with Mr. Goulston, talked about alternate careers, uh, and I'm advising the promotions committee that he be asked to withdraw. So I wasn't failing, miraculously. But I think what happened is I I cratered, meaning I said, what does this mean? And uh, the dean of students said, you've been kicked out. And uh, and it was my good fortune that I didn't complain, whine, or blame. They can't do this. I just, I just, it was, it was like a gunshot wound. And I just, I just kind of almost doubled over. And I'm not religious or spiritual, but I kept touching my cheekbones because I thought I was bleeding from my eyes. I kept looking at my fingers. It was very weird. I was touching them like this and looking. And of course, it wasn't blood. It was tears. And and so imagine that you reach a point where you bottom out. You know, people who have alcohol problems will talk about that they bottomed out. So I guess for me, you know, I was addicted to covering up 
all the mess I was underneath with sarcasm, cynicism. And I just really run out. I'd run out. So I wasn't even using that anymore because I was at a low point. And then he hit me with what I call the trifecta of hope. And he said, uh, uh, you didn't mess up because you're passing, but you are messed up. Uh, but if you get unmessed up, I think the school would be glad they gave you a second chance. Because he had read something I had written that, I guess, touched him. But here was the trifecta of hope. He said, even if you don't get unmessed up, even if you don't become a doctor, even if you don't do anything with the rest of your life, I'd be proud to know you. Because you have something very special inside you. So he saw something special that probably had to do not with what I do, but something about me. Maybe underneath the sarcasm, he saw goodness. I don't know what he saw. So that was the first leg. It was really like unconditional love. And then he said, you have something special in you that the world needs, and you won't know how much it needs it until you're 35. So he saw a future for me that I didn't see. And then he looked at me, and I am crying at this point. I mean, he is just hitting me with compassion and love and caring. Uh, uh, I didn't know what to make of it. And then he said, look at me, and he pointed his finger at me. And he said, you deserve to be on this planet. So you have to make it till you're 35. And you're going to let me help you. So the first leg is he saw something in me. There was an unconditional love for me, I call it. He saw a future for me that I didn't see. And then he stood up for me. He arranged an appeal to the medical school. And he was just a PhD standing up to medical doctors, heads of hospitals who are on the uh, promotions committee. And then I had to sort of appeal my uh, uh, cause. Why, you know, why should they give me a second leave of absence? And they did. But I think what happened is uh, because if he had said to me, call me, I can help you, I would have gone back to my apartment, probably been very proud. And, you know, quite frankly, I might not be here today. So there was something where I fell apart in front of someone. And uh, uh, and I'm not religious, but I think he was an angel sent into my life to save it. Yeah. And when an angel steps into your life and saves it, you walk differently. So I took a year off. I, I, I worked at a famous psychiatric center called the Menninger Foundation. And it turned out that I did have something, some sort of knack. I was able to connect with schizophrenic, schizophrenic farm young men and young women. And, uh, uh, and knowing that, I realized, well, I'll go back to medical school. I'll do my best to finish it. And then I'll go become a psychiatrist. And, which is exactly what I did. But I think what happened is I tucked inside me the trifecta of hope. And that's something that I used for over 35 years with my patients, but especially my suicidal patients, and none of them died by suicide. And I just paid it forward. Now, granted, uh, uh, this may not apply to people who are drug addicts and alcoholics who are always in denial, always angry, always manipulating you. But the people who came to me who were just purely hurting, purely hurting from the pain of life and not wanting to go on. And so I think that turned a corner, and I've just been paying it forward ever since. And uh, I'm in my 70s. And and I like where it's taken me. So I just wanted to share that with you, uh, because if you're out there, and I can understand if life is hard and you're trying to survive, it's very difficult to come from abundance. It's much easier to come from scarcity. Although I'll end with this, and then I'd welcome you know your comments. Uh, uh, one of the things I would do with my depressed patients sometimes, my depressed patients often would when I press them, what's going on, what's going on, they would say, down deep, I'm not sure that I deserve to be happy because all I think about is myself. I'm totally consumed with myself. Oh, wow. Yeah. You know, when you press, you know, and, and, and when they would say that, one of the things I would do is I would start giving them healthy snacks, 
a box of them and I'd say, whenever you pass a homeless person, and there's plenty of them in Los Angeles, anytime you see a homeless person and you're walking, I want you to always carry a healthy snacks with you and reach into your pocket, hold one out. You don't want to scare them, go up to them, identify yourself, ask them their name, and your hand is outstretched. Look them in the eye and say, hi, my name is Mark. They'll tell you their name and you give them the snack because a lot of times you don't want to give money if you're afraid they're Mm -hmm. going to use it for drugs and alcohol. You know, give them the snack and then look them in the eye and say, you know, just do your best. Hang in there. And when these depressed and when these particular people who said all they cared about were themselves, when they would come in the next time, I'd say, how did it how did it work? And they would begrudgingly say to me, I think it helped. (laughs) <laughs> well, I think it will help. I, I'm not sure that all depressed people only think of themselves. I know when I was depressed, it wasn't so much thinking of myself as just not being able to think very much at all about anything positive and feeling, I think I've said, be- again, I've said before on this show, feeling a paralysis and not being able to move out of that mood or or energy or whatever you want to call it. And I love the fact that you were given that that helping hand at that age. Would that I had been given that because I might have also have had that that hope, that that real abundance factor in my life at an earlier stage. It's there now, but it certainly wasn't there at the same time, you know, the age that you're talking about. I mean at that time I was feeling still feeling very depressed. I had a lot of anxieties. I really wasn't coping very well. And like you, it would come out in how I spoke a lot of the time. So I think sometimes I could be very cutting to people. But it was part of that armor, part of that armor that I'd had to put around me um, to say, no, I'm not, you know, I'm okay, I'm fine, which I'd been practicing for years by the time I was in my early 20s, which is what I'm envisaging right now. So there was always this this suit of armor that made me into a person who could be quite cutting, I think, although never intentionally. It was just the way my my speech was as part of this kind of hardened shell. Mm -hmm. And... um, so, yeah, I can see that. Now, that softened over the years because then I started to realize that people think I'm being really dismissive and I don't mean to be. That's not what I'm meaning to be. And so I had to start looking at myself and changing the way I related to people, basically, because I'd had this massively thick suit of armor that I put around myself to try and make myself impregnable. Now, did it make myself impregnable? No, it didn't. And I I did have a, a, a moment or well, a couple of times where I just completely broke down and, um, you know, it took me some while to get back on my feet again because I didn't have all of those those tools, the background, the the understanding and love around me, I feel, that help, that would have helped me get through all of this. So I think that's one of the reasons why I'm so passionate about helping other people right now is because I didn't have it when I was younger. And it doesn't matter how old you are, you can get through all of that pain uh, if you have the right people supporting you. Even if it's just somebody randomly, just giving you that random kindness, actually talking about the homeless, Having you know, offering that random kindness to a homeless person, that can help you too. So yeah, it, it's 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 hugely important. And I always say about the homeless, there but for the grace of God, right? Because we're all, or, or we, many of us, are just a paycheck or two paychecks away from being homeless. And I think that's probably even more true in the United States than it is here in the UK. So I always. Um, try my best or not try my best, but I do my best to connect with homeless people, to speak to them. And here in the UK, of course, we have something called The Big Issue, which is a magazine which is 
um, given to homeless people to sell so that they can earn money. And so if I ever see a big issue seller, I do stop and buy one because that's a one another way of helping them and helping them pay for their shelter or whatever they have to pay for in life. So, yeah, it's important, I think. It's important to pay it forward. It's important to support anybody and everybody because we're all in this together. Yeah, yeah I went on a bit there, didn't I? But um, before we go on even more, I've just realised we've come up we've come up to the first break of our chat together. So right now, let's take a very short break, listen to these messages from our station sponsors, and Mark and I will be back right after this. UK Health Radio, the station that makes you feel good. The station that makes you feel good. And you're listening to Hurt Less, Live More here on UK Health Radio, the world's number one talk health radio station with me, JJ Stenhouse and Dr. Mark Goulston. And before the break, Mark, we were talking about depression and um and, you know, just falling apart, basically, and then building up this armor around us so that we wouldn't be so vulnerable. Yes. And, and I want to ask you if you can share uh, how you believe you got through and and what you learn and how that has transitioned now to wanting to help people. I can do that. Yeah, it, it was a long journey for me. I have to say, I I was pretty lost for a lot of my life. Although, you know, you wouldn't think it to see me, right? I I probably looked terribly confident. I was in a business where you had to be terribly confident. And um, so, yeah, there was this, again, this armor that, that, um, that was around me all the time. But I did go to some very dark places. I I went to one very, very dark place for a a, a while. And what got me through, I have to say, was finding people who I could work with, who could help me, who could give me the tools to see me through, who could support me and mentor me and coach me. So we've, we've talked about this before on this show, but it was a long process of coaching, mentoring, um, doing work energetically as well. Now, you know, in terms of, um, nutrition and, and, you know, that sort of thing, I did used to drink a lot because I was a journalist and we drank a lot. And when I was in my teens and early twenties, I smoked a lot too. I smoked about 40 Marlboro a day, you know, the red ones, not the mild ones. When I was probably around 17, 18, 19, 20. Uh, that kind of age. Um, I haven't smoked for many, many years now, but at that time I was. So I was really, you know, trying to find a way to deaden the pain and alcohol, cigarettes, they helped. But what I was also doing at the same time is I I, I was interested in, in natural uh, medicine. I was interested in natural living. And so that was there as well. And, and probably... That's what saved me. I think that's one of the things that, that kept me going was the fact that I didn't completely ruin my body and my brain. So that mm-hmm. combined with a whole bunch of mentors and uh, and coaches and people who could support me energetically as well, that's what got me through. But it was a long process. And, you know, sometimes you do better than others. But over the years, that armor disintegrated. I realized I didn't need that anymore. Um, And you ask why, you know, how I got to this point where I have such a passion for helping other people. Well, it's because I see so many people around me who are in the same state right now, and they need support. They need help. And especially right now. I mean, look at what's happening in the world right now. A lot of people are scared. A lot of people are trying to numb the pain. You know, I'm uh, not far behind you in terms of age, Mark, and I actually feel healthier and happier in every way now than I did when I was in my 20s. 
Now, you might say that's because you're not drinking lots of red wine, smoking 20 Marlboro, but it's it's the truth. In fact, a while back, I, I was often doing a talk called uh, More Alive at 65 because I actually felt more alive in my mid-60s than and feel, still feel more alive now than I did when I was 25. So it's a long process, but I urge anybody who's listening to reach out and and get some support and some love around you, because I think that's the key. Absolutely. Um, I want to run something by you, just your thoughts, because mm-hmm. uh, um, I was recently inspired by watching a documentary uh, about Mr. Rogers. It was called Mr. Rogers and Me. And it's not any of the well-known documentaries, the one or, or the movie with Tom Hanks. And, and there was a comment he made, which was better to be deep and simple than shallow and complex. Meaning the more you can simplify things, the more you can wrap your head and your hands around it. And, and, and so that's really inform the way I try to look at things. And so uh, I applied that to depression and anxiety. And I, and here's a work in progress. And I wonder what you think. It seems to me that disappointment is inevitable, inevitable in life. And I think I wrote an article some time ago, the difference between disappointment, D-I-S appointment, and disappointment, D-Y-S appointment. So Disappointment, D-I-S, means you had an expectation and it just didn't happen. You know, you expected something, it didn't happen. Disappointment, D-Y-S, is you had an expectation and it didn't happen, but it was very painful. Mm. So D-Y-S means painful, dysthymia, dysarthria, Mm -hmm. just whatever. And so I had this notion that uh, something that contributes to depression is that you had an expectation about something, and the more you were counting on it, uh, oh, this will change my life, this will make me happy, and the more you were invested in it, when it didn't happen, the, the more vulnerable you are to not just become disappointed, but dys appointed and depressed. You know, that there's a triggering event. Geez, I thought my career would work out. I thought my marriage would work out. I thought a whole bunch of things would work out, and it didn't. And so I had this thought that if you could turn DYS appointment into DIS appointment, meaning what was the expectation that I had? How much was I counting on it? Uh, and was I counting on it so much that I didn't have a backup plan so that when it fell apart, did I just crater? Did I just fall through the cracks? And a lot of people don't have backup plans to anything. You know, they they just say, oh, this this is gonna work. This has to work. Mm-hmm. And then I and then I had a thought about anxiety. So to me, there's a the the idea of an expectation that didn't happen and you don't know how to deal with it can contribute to depression. I mean, there's all of other factors. There's chemical, there's all other things. And then I thought. Maybe anxiety, what contributes to anxiety is that you're anticipating something in the future, you're anxious about it, and you're thinking, and if it doesn't happen, I won't be able to handle it. So maybe the anxiety is you have a future expectation, but if you're not certain about it, if you're not confident about it, it triggers anxiety, but the anxiety is if I'm counting on this, if I'm counting on this job, if I'm counting on this relationship, and it doesn't work out, I won't be able to handle it. And so I, th- so, so I think if you can use that in your mind, well, how much of that is true? Because I believe that if we feel we can handle any disappointment, and disappointments happen every day, if we can handle any disappointment— there's a good chance that we can be less depressed and less anxious. I mean, you know, if you're thinking of anxiety and you're expecting something, well, the worst thing that happens, it doesn't happen. You know? yeah. So, you know, it's, it's not the end of the world. And and I think there's ways to build up your muscle. And, and if you see any disappointment as a chance to build up your muscle that can make you resilient, 
And I think one of the one of the ways to do that is if a disappointment happens in the future or one from the past, you could say, well, how much was I counting on it? Uh, why uh, why did I think that if it doesn't go right, my life is over? You know, what made me think that I I, I couldn't deal with it? Uh, geez, how come I didn't have a backup plan? And again, it's human nature that most people will, will not have a backup plan. Well, if this job falls through, you know, well, I'll just find another job. If this relationship ends, well, it's going to hurt. It'll be take time to get over, but it doesn't mean that I'm not going to be in a relationship again. So d- does any of that make sense or does that seem just too intellectual? It, I can see how that can be. Yes, I can. I, I do um, see it. I see it um, coming much more from an adult perspective though. And what I was thinking of as you were talking was my depression started as a child. So as a child, you're not intellectualizing at all. So where did that, where did that depression came from? It came from not feeling safe. It came from not having, not feeling you had the backup, the, um, the approval. All of those things, which happens in, in many, I'm gonna, I'm not gonna say normal families because no family is normal, but you know, in many other families. So um, for instance, I spoke to, with somebody recently who was in business and she was talking about how she had gone into business and she was, she grew up in a family where business was seen as something positive. I grew up in a family where business was seen as something negative. And so, you know, completely different perspective. And, and my, my attitude towards business has always been sort of very standoffish and a bit hot and cold. Whereas hers was, let me at it. Let me do it. I'm up for this. And so therefore could be a success and not have those disappointments. Now, when you're a child, I think that the disappointment, you don't, you don't intellectualize it as disappointment. It's a feeling of lack of safety. It's a feeling of unhappiness. It's a feeling of not really knowing why you're feeling unhappy, but you are because you don't know any different. You don't yet know about disappointment so much. I mean, you might be disappointed you didn't get what you wanted for Christmas or your birthday, but that's not quite the same. That's not what we're really talking about here, is it? So, yeah, I can see what you're, what you're saying is something which for an adult, you can see how that would work. But I'm wondering about children. What do you think about that? Well, I'm glad you brought that up because I, I actually had a recent conversation with Melissa Bernstein. She was uh, a guest on the show and, mm-hmm. and she and her husband, Melissa and Doug, they own this tremendously successful toy company. And she started another company called landlines because it didn't save her from depression and she would and she'd been depressed most of her life and uh and so i recently called her and i said i want to run something by you there's there's a presentation that over the years i've given to parents of children of all ages and uh and what i've said to them is uh this is how your child and probably your personality developed When we go through life, we're always stepping into the unknown, and that can be exciting, and it can be positive, or it can be uh, a setback, disastrous and hurtful. And when we're young and it hurts, or actually when it's happy, we often look back to our parents for their input. So uh, even when we, you know, score a goal uh, in in cricket or rugby or whatever, we look at our parents, did I do good? Yeah. Or, yeah. or if we fell down and our knees are bleeding, we look at them, am I going to be okay? And what I speak to the parents groups about is that your child is going to look at you and they're going to internalize your response. And there's there's four responses you can have and you can have a mixture of them. One is you can be, in this day and age, overly coddling, uh, which doesn't prepare them for the world. Oh, poor baby. Oh, let me see. And you can be overly emotional because their hurt is your hurt. But that doesn't really prepare them for the world. And they can grow up kind of spoiled because you bailed them out as opposed to you know, telling them they could handle it. Yeah. Or you can 
critical. You can look at them, uh, you know, with a, uh, a disapproval, like stop it already, stop crying, stop crying, you know, just don't be a baby. Uh, or you can just ignore them. You can, you know, be a parent who's stuck in your own problems or alcoholism, and you're not available. So when they look at you, they get nothing. And that, and they can internalize that. If they internalize being coddled and spoiled, when they find out the world's not going to do that, uh, they can have tantrums, you know, as they get older, because they want, they're used to someone taking care of it for them. When someone's been critical of their hurt, they can end up actually being angry, angry as adolescents. Well, I don't care. You know, I'm not going to try. Why try? You know, because it's all a bunch of BS. And then if uh, people, parents have been totally absent, they can just feel alone. Oh, I'm not going to take any chances because if I fall on my face, I'm all alone. And the fourth alternative is what we call a loving teacher, mentor, coach. So when you look at them, you see they're focusing on what's upsetting you or you're excited about, but then they, they have you talk about it. God, uh, uh, what happened? And then they talk you through it. Uh, what happened when you, when you hurt yourself? Uh, what did you feel? Well, I was scared. What did you think? Oh, I, I was worried. Did I break something? I, what did you do? Well, I, you know, I, I came to you or I, yeah. uh, I, I went and saw the nurse and, and how did that work out? So it's, so do you follow me? You work it through and they're internalizing that no matter what happens to them, there's a response you can have and, and they're internalizing, oh, I didn't realize. And you're teaching them to walk through their emotions, their thoughts and their actions. And they learn from you. Yeah, and they learn, and they learn to be stronger, um, and uh, uh, and you can get. And I think that's one of the reasons that I mentor so many people, because I hadn't developed that all the way up into med school when I got depressed, and the dean of students was a loving teacher, mentor, coach. Yeah, yeah, and I internalized that, you know, after I cratered. And it, it's almost like it healed something at my core, which I then paid forward. So I think you can do that with your children, and uh, and they and, and they they will internalize uh, your uh, uh, your response to their hurt, but also to their success. Uh, I want to share a story, but I'm, are we getting close to our we next are, break? We are. We are. We yeah. So why don't we wait and hear your story? until after this short break while we hear from our station sponsors once again we'll be back right after this UK Health Radio the station that makes you feel good UK Health Radio the station that makes you feel good And you're listening to Hurt Less, Live More on UK Health Radio with me, JJ, the practical alchemist and Dr. Mark Goulston. And Mark, you were going to tell us a story before we took a break there. Yeah, I think it's a story about the effect that parents can have on their children because children internalize what they receive from parents or they don't receive. And one of the other things that I did in my uh, in my career is uh, people know that I was a suicide specialist, but I was also a death and dying specialist. So I would do house calls to dying patients. And there was one that I was seeing who was uh, very famous. He was, he had won Grammys in uh, three or four decades. And uh, he was as known for his drug use 20 or 30 years earlier uh, as he was for his music. And a lot of these people, when I would visit doing house calls to them, they liked that I could just be direct. And I said to him, what was all that stuff about drugs and the police and all that? And he said, when I was a child, I knew that 
I had a gift as a musician, but I also had a very pushy mother and pushy managers. And so whenever I did well, and I had this talent, they would sort of take credit for it. That's our little boy. Now you're doing the right thing. And and I really resented it. I didn't resent it so much that, you know, that I stopped music because that was part of my identity. But I really resented the way they would take credit for it. And one of the things I discovered with drugs, hard drugs, is nobody took credit for that. Mm. He said, when I did drugs, I it was 100% me. Nobody took credit for it. And he said, what I realized is we all need a part of ourselves that is that belongs to us. And recently, I, I, I like making distinctions. And uh, there's, a, uh, there's a kind of a failure to launch 30-something young man that I'm helping. And again, he doesn't have drug or alcohol problems. But, you know, he has parents who, you know, wonder what he's going to do with his life. And I had the good fortune to speak to the parents. And I thought, these parents really care about him. And one of the things we talked about, which flipped a switch in him, is I said, do you think your parents are disappointed in you? And he said, oh, yeah, because I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing. And blip, 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 blip. I said, I don't think they're disappointed in you. I think they're worried about you. Uh, because my sense of them is they actually care about your well-being and being happy. They just don't know what you're doing to uh, to to land in your future, and they're worried about it. And they're not they're, they're and they're not overly controlling. And it flipped the switch in him because as long as he felt that they were disappointed in him, he resented them. But he could understand that they were worried about him. And we've had conversations since then. And here's a distinction I've made. I think uh, there are some parents like stage moms, stage dads, who when they live too much through you, when their identity is too connected to your career, they can get disappointed in you because they're overly involved in your success being their success. You're getting that extra scoop of ice cream that they didn't get. And Mm -hmm. when you don't get it for them, they get ticked off and they're disappointed in you. Whereas I think a loving parent, like I am, I've never been disappointed in any of my children, but I have been worried and I've been disappointed for them. Meaning Mm -hmm. if they go down this path there's a high likelihood it's going to backfire. And that's a and, big distinction, isn't it? Being disappointed before. Totally. Mm. Uh, and, and I can point it out to them, but, you know, again, if they want to learn on their own and fall on their face, then uh, we all often learn from that. And so, yeah. you know, so I will back off, but it's not being disappointed in them because I'm living through them. Yeah. It's yeah. because, you know, I can see that if they go down a path, with a relationship or a job, they're just going to feel hurt. And, and I, I guess hurt is necessary to learn, but, uh, but I know that it's almost inevitable, but they'll learn from it. Mm-hmm. But I thought that was an interesting distinction. Yeah. And if you're, if you're listening in and you have children, especially teenagers, if they think you're disappointed in them, uh, but what you really are is worried you might want to point out that distinction to them and say, do you think I'm disappointed in you? And if they say yes, you might want to bring up, I'm not disappointed in you at all. You're my child. I love you. I'm worried about you. And I'm worried because, you know, you're doing various things that are that are going to hurt you or that the world's not going to like but I realize that 
maybe that's what you have to do to learn. But don't ever think I'm disappointed in you because I love you. Yeah, it must be. It's it's very important to make that distinction. And it's very important to talk about these things. I know when uh, I um, became a journalist, my father was very disappointed in me or appeared to be very disappointed in me because he thought journalists were the scum of the earth. And he said so. And that didn't feel good at all. But, you know, um, if my, at that time, when my father said, what on earth do you want to become a journalist for? It made me even more determined to be one. So, you know, in some senses, it can spur you on. But it would have been nice if there had been that distinction made. And I had felt in some way supported. Yeah. Would yeah, there was a big, big difference. There was a grudge that I held towards my father because, uh, and and I've since he, he died 25 years ago, and I've apologized to him on multiple occasions since then. And, and when I talked about various careers, he would grill me on the ones that, you know, probably had less of a chance for success. And he's not a lawyer, he's not a doctor, but, you know, it's, it's frequently that's what you want your child to be. And I remember when I told him I was going to be pre-medical, I was going to be a doctor, he said, that's my boy. And the grudge I held was, which was stupid in retrospect, and I, and I, I beat up on myself for it, is I wish he had said, why do you want to become a doctor? I wish he had grilled me on, you know, that's a lot of years. It's a lot of work. Uh, You have to delay gratification. And so the grudge was not that he said that he was glad I was going to be a doctor. It's that he grilled me on all the other things. And, and, And he was very smart. And he grilled me in such a way that he talked me out of them. And, uh, uh, and when I said I was going to be a doctor, that was something that he just checked the box. And I guess I got even with him because I, I'm not like other doctors. <laughs> I mean, I became a psychiatrist, which is very different. Mm-hmm. And I'm not, even, I'm not even like other psychiatrists. I mean, I did psychotherapy instead of medication and that sort of yeah. thing. Yeah. And then, and then even since then, uh, and, I, and I, I feel very fortunate I was able to transition into coaching and mentoring and writing, whereas uh, so many of my colleagues, some of my medical uh, friends in the healthcare professions, they're really running into burnout. They feel kind of trapped. They feel sort of exhausted. So one of the things that we do is if we don't have that support from the family, let's say, parents, we look elsewhere. We look elsewhere for mentors and um I think this is a story that you'll appreciate. I mean, one of the the f- public figures who helped me through very difficult times in my life was David Bowie. David Bowie, the singer, songwriter, megastar, who actually died the same year as my father, although there were about 30-something years in age difference there. And And I was thinking actually the other day of writing a piece called Rock and Roll Suicide Saved My Life because I found David Bowie's, his absolute not caring about what the world thought of him. He just did his own thing. He was creative. He didn't mind. He was, he was daring to be different. And he, he seemed although I'm sure that uh, there were many demons in there at various stages in his life, he seemed to have this charmed life of an artist. And then the words of some of his um, uh, of his songs were bizarre often, but often really quite profound. And the one track, Rock and Roll Suicide, was one that I very often played very loudly and really got into and really felt the emotion of the song and there is one point in the song where I think it's in the chorus where he, he almost shouts, Oh, no, love, you're not alone. And I took that on board fully. Oh, no, 
you're not alone. And I realize that I'm not alone and that there are people out there who feel the same way as me and who are also struggling to get through and who, but you know, in his case, were able to channel in that creativity and make some fantastic art. But it was such a support for me, weirdly. So yeah, I thought you might like that story. Rock and roll suicide saved my life. And I felt that it was one of the things that really spurred me on to keep going. You know, and I'd be driving home from the newspaper I worked at maybe, and I'd have that absolutely full volume in the car and I'd be singing along to it. Yeah. So, you know, all sorts of things can help to get you through. That's a great story. Something I've been talking about, and I, I may mention it in in previous episodes, I think journaling may have saved my life because when I finally got through medical school, it took me six years because I took two years off. I took out a journal and I wasn't a, I wasn't a writer. I was a doctor. You know, I'd, I'd write orders. I'd see patients, but I wasn't a writer. I think I was a B or C student in any English course because, you know, I was a scientist, a mathematic, I think. And, and I took out a little crappy journal and I wrote down, I can't believe I made it through they have graduated a madman. <laughs> and I'm on volume 256, 45,000 pages, nine books, 1,100 blogs and articles. And what I would do is I would just uh, write down anything I thought or felt that was worth writing down. And, and people might say, well, what are you going to do with it? Why are you doing it? Why are you wasting your time? And what I realized is if I thought something and I felt it, it was worth writing down because I might want to think about it again. And it was a way of just ex- that what I thought or felt was a, at the very least worth writing down. And then I would notice themes. And if there was a repetitive theme, that might eventually turn into an article, or maybe that would turn into a book many years later. Mm-hmm. But I, but I think it saved my life. And here's the funny thing when I tell the story is I have 256 of these notebooks. They're in my office all piled up. They're illegible. I can't <laughs> read my right. No, I'm a doctor. Let's say, you know, right, it looks like the, you know, you write a prescription. They are all illegible. I oh, mean, my God. Uh, yeah. But what will happen is I'll write something down and every now and then it'll be a little bit legible for about three sentences. And then it just turns into chicken scratch. And, <laughs> and, and, and here's how uh, I love my children and my family, but they're much more practical than me. And my oldest daughter, when she was uh, young, she said to me, you know, dad, if you die, uh, we could only sell those journals of yours for 25 cents a piece because they're all used. And here's the irony. She's 40 years old and she would say the same thing now. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Mark, we have come to the end. I can't believe it. I've really enjoyed this. this um, uh, uh, just this sharing between us today. It's been fantastic. Um, but, you know, we've got to go. That's it. Time's up. So um, thank you so much. It's been great. I hope you've enjoyed it as well. And I hope, oh. uh, yeah, hope our listeners no, I, have as well. Yes. I, I uh, And if, to our listeners, thank you for indulging the two of us. <laughs> yes, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, so thank you to everybody for listening today. Uh, we've, absolutely we've had a ball we hope you've really enjoyed it and also got something from it and if you have got something from this then do share because you never know it might be just the thing that somebody you know needs to hear so do put the word out and share this episode of the show and yeah join us again on uk health radio here for more hurt less live more from me and mark goodbye for now